We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. So the idea that women have evolved to be plant gatherers and men hunters has dominated evolutionary thinking and the popular imagination for decades. It's been suggested that men are better navigators than women as a result of a long history of natural selection on hunters who can pursue mobile prey across vast landscapes without getting lost. Men are thought to be more cooperative than women because throughout our evolutionary history, they've needed to work together to bring down hunted prey much larger than themselves. Men's hunting is argued to have driven the evolution of our two-legged gait, supplied the nutritional advantages in protein and fat to support our energetically expensive brain, and given our juveniles the luxury of a long pre-reproductive life of relative leisure in which they can take the time to learn all the skills of adulthood. Although it's widely recognized that women's gathering is usually the more reliable contributor to family subsistence, we also tend to think that men's hunting must be, on the whole, more productive than women's foraging because they often take very large animals. Some have even argued that the origins of the nuclear family, where men and women cooperate in different tasks, lie in the evolutionary origins of female specializing in childcare and depending on a man's hunting production in order to feed her children. The generalization that men tend to hunt and women gather holds for some well-known contemporary hunter-gatherers. So among the Hadza in Tanzania, for example, women primarily gather plant foods, lower quality, small package food items, high in carbohydrates, and men typically spend their time hunting, acquiring higher quality, large package food items, high in protein and fat. Similarly, among the Juntwasi in Botswana and Namibia, and the Aceh in Paraguay, women specialize almost entirely on plant-based foods while men hunt. However, this is not a universal pattern. There is a great deal of variation among hunter-gatherers in the extent to which women do specialize on plant foods. And many hunter-gatherer women do acquire animals. There's the Agta, the Ainu, and the Diné, where women hunt deer. The Cree, where women hunt caribou and geese. Central African Aka women hunt for dikers and forest pigs. Mixed-gender communal hunts for rabbits were common among the Shoshone, and Paiute women hunted, and in many cases still hunt, ground squirrels and prairie dogs. Australia is another place that challenges our understanding of who hunts and why. Across Australia, prehistorically, women were active hunters. They had a primary focus on the hand capture of small to medium-sized animals. And in many locations, women skillfully used fire and hunted with dogs to improve their efficiency. For example, Phyllis Kayberry found Walmajari women in the Kimberley in 1935 were using dogs to hunt kangaroo and monitor lizards. And she suggested that the family was dependent on the woman's efforts to a greater extent than on those of her husband. In the 1950s, Jane Goodale also found that Tiwi women were active and productive hunters. And she too characterized women as the most consistent providers, not only of plant foods, but of meat as well, especially meat from small animals. The people I work with, Mardu, Marta women of Australia's western desert, too, are hunters more than anything else. On any given day, between about 60 to 70 percent of the bush food that's produced is from women's hunting. Women take more than half of the parenti. This is one of the largest species of monitor lizard, aside from the Komodo dragon. 
Women also take a little more than half of the feral cats. Feral cats spread into the desert starting about 100 years ago and were readily adopted as prey by Marty hunters. Women will take, take about 20% of the bustard and 6% of the kangaroo. So bustard are the largest flying bird in, uh, in Australia, and males can weigh up to 20 kilograms. Kangaroo are the largest endemic non-human in Australia and weigh up to 80 kilograms. So these are large for Australia. Not for Africa, but for Australia. The staple prey of Mardi women are the smaller sand monitor lizards, sometimes called goanna, and they acquire more than 80% of them. They're easily the most abundant large vertebrate in the desert. They weigh about half a kilo. Women hunt them in two ways, which vary seasonally. In the hot summer months, they track the monitors on the surface, hoping to chase them to trees or corner them in the open to avoid having to dig them out of their dens. In the winter, the monitors are denned most of the time, and they have to be dug out. So to accomplish this, and also to aid in the search for fresh dens, women burn the spinifex grass that obscures the tracks and signs. Women often cooperate with each other in sand monitor and parenti hunting, so they work together to burn an area for hunting, to locate tracks and dens, and then to extract the animal. Now, the most important thing nutritionally about a monitor lizard is not the meat, it's the fat. So lizards become dormant in the cool season. They lay down about 10 to 20% of their body weight in the form of large fat bodies in the abdomen and the tail. And most people say a skinny lizard isn't actually worth eating, so women really pride themselves on being able to find and capture fat ones. Now, while Mardi women do a lot of hunting, they also do most of the collecting, too. So they produce nearly 100% of things like roots, 98% of insect larvae, 90% of the fruit, um, a lot of the nectar, and about 30% of the honey. Now, in comparison, men are looking for small things. About 30% of the time they're out foraging, but most of the time they prefer to search for the larger animals, like emu, kangaroo, and bustard. And rather than hunting cooperatively like women, they primarily hunt alone. Now, the social context of hunting is similar to what you might see in any hunter-gatherer society. So women leave the residential camp and a group of other women, often with children along. They establish what they call a dinner camp. They acquire food. They return to that temporary dinner camp to cook and consume food socially. And then they return to the residential camp at the end of the day. So the question that I'm going to start off with is, why are women hunting? So traditionally, if we think about men's hunting, the goals of men's hunting are explained in usually in one of two ways. So either men are hunting in order to provision a nuclear family, or men are hunting to show off their skill and attract alliances and favorable, favorable attention from women. In many cases, the kinds of hunting that men do don't appear to be well designed to provision others. Um, and when men focus almost solely on large animals, they sometimes run the risk of coming home empty-handed, especially in more arid environments, such as this one. Uh, where animals are patchy and very infrequently encountered. So per hour spent hunting, a kangaroo hunter does tend to average a higher return than a monitor lizard hunter, taking home over a kilo of meat, while a sand monitor hunter gets only a third of that. But the meat from larger animals, kangaroo, buster, that sort of thing, comes in only very infrequently, about once in every five hunts. And although the average is higher, there are often many days when nothing is acquired by any hunter. So in comparison, women's hunting is much more reliable than men's. They don't have as many big bonanzas, but they also don't have as many days with less than they might need. Men only end up out producing women on 25% of days, and on 37% of days, no men are successful at hunting any type of game. Fully a third of these meat droughts are between about three and six days in duration. And for women, in comparison, failure is less than 5%, and they don't have any meat droughts. So, even though larger animals have a higher mean return, in reality, this obscures the fact that men's production comes in the form of these periodic huge bonanzas and long meat droughts, rather than a steady daily stream. The meat from larger animals is also distributed widely. The hunter keeps only about 10% for himself and his own family. After sharing, the returns to a hunter's family in terms of the grams of meat per hour hunting is the same, regardless of what kind of animal has been acquired. Now, if women's hunting is more reliable and provides similar payoffs to family consumption when successful, as does men's hunting, then it might suggest, maybe, that the goals of foraging for men and women are different, that men might be hunting to show off their skill and attract alliances and favorable attention, while women are foraging simply to feed themselves and their families. So women hunt more reliable, smaller animals, and they trade off this reliability with larger harvests, because reliability is a better way to reduce the risks of going hungry. Um, so it might suggest something like men hunt to share and women hunt to eat. 
Men use the hunting and sharing of highly valued meat to engage themselves in these political arenas of social competition and social support. And kangaroo hunting by men is an overtly political game where young men hunt for public consumption, they donate their labor to gain the trust that's required to gain access to deeper levels of ritual secrets, which are very important for men. They work to provide meat for all, especially in-laws and potential in-laws, without any material reward in order to gain the trust of older men who guard the way that secret ritual knowledge is transferred and gained. So a man who demonstrates willingness to work for the public good is trusted with more ritual secrets, and he can rise in the ritual hierarchy. A man who demonstrates willingness to work for his in-laws um, was traditionally trusted with the opportunity to marry their daughter. Hunting for men is as much about ensuring trust and cooperation in the distribution of meat as it is about showing off skill in acquiring meat. When men talk about the benefits of hunting, they emphasize that they hunt to share. They don't hunt to eat or favor their own children and families over others. If men hunt to share, do women then hunt only to feed their families? When you hunt with martyr women, what puzzles you the most is not the hunting, it's actually the sharing. So more than 70% of the time, women's harvests of small animals are shared well beyond their own families. And on an astounding 23% of lizard hunts, a successful hunter will take nothing for herself. She gives it all away either to her own family members or to other people sitting around the cooking fire. When women share, they often exchange identical lizards, and the hunter will always give away the largest prey to someone else. Lizards are shared to others who have already eaten. Um, in this video, the hunter returned late, and she's the last to cook and share her harvest. And she gives away nearly the entire harvest to other women and men in the group. She keeps only the bottom half of one for herself. Um, one of the women that cooperated with her hunting, she receives three lizards in the initial division. She passes two to those sitting behind her and one to the woman on her left, and the hunter passes one to her husband. Things are transferring back and forth. And ultimately, out of a harvest of six large lizards, each hunter received less than 8%, and all of the non-hunters got portions that were actually bigger than each of the hunter's portion. And the goal in this distribution was to make sure everyone present around the fire had an equal sized portion and nobody went hungry. Not only do women share extensively with each other, they share in ways that don't make sense economically. So women often exhibit a producer's disadvantage in sharing. So when you have a producer's disadvantage, the size of the portion the hunter, the producer keeps, is smaller than the average size of portions given away to those that didn't participate in the hunt. And the usual cross-cultural pattern is for producers to take an advantage, to compensate themselves for paying the cost of going out and acquiring the food item, right? They usually keep a portion that's bigger than any of the portions that are given out to non-hunters. But when Marta women hunt small animals, like monitor lizards, they often keep a smaller individual portion than the average portion size given to a non-hunter or family member. And we don't see this pattern for men. When men share small animals, they'll take the producer's advantage, and they'll keep a larger portion for themselves. Women, compared to men, also give away more portions. Given an average size harvest, women will give out more than twice as many portions as men. They usually give out around six, um, compared to men who give out two. Because they give out more portions than men, their average portion size is a little bit smaller, but they prevent the portion size from becoming too small by stinting themselves in favor of feeding others. Now the cost that the hunter pays doesn't seem to be balanced by shares coming in. So a successful hunter gets significantly less from others than an unsuccessful hunter or someone who didn't hunt at all. So that the hunter who acquired the most often takes home the smallest share of meat after all sharing has been accounted for. So women are way too generous with small prey than we might expect if we're thinking about sort of the simple economics of sharing. It's also the case that in the sharing, women are not just sending those larger shares to family members, stinting their own consumption in favor of their children or their close kin. Women also share widely beyond their own kinship network, and they also share mainly to other women. So this is a network of sharing relationships between people who made dinner camps with each other. The circular nodes, the circles are women, the squares are men, and the color corresponds to the kinship clusters in the bottom diagram. Okay? Those are the four or five major kinship clusters in the community. The ties between each of the nodes are those who had shares of meat passing between them. Sharing cross-cuts kinship ties, and it brings together women from all kinship clusters in the community. 
So our hypothesis that women are hunting to provision their families seems poorly supported. Why hunt at all if it's only going to share, if you're only going to share most of it to unrelated dinner camp members? Marta themselves suggest that one of the main reasons that women hunt is to acquire meat to share with other women. When Marta women talk about hunting, they describe their underlying motivation as hunting to share. This is especially the case for women who are known as Merlia, good hunters. Anyone can gain the status of a good hunter, but to be a Merlia, you don't simply produce more, you also share more of that production with others. So as one hunter put it, when a Merlia goes out hunting, she has a good feeling that she's going to get so much and be able to feed others. Good hunters always think that when they go out and it helps them to hunt better. When a really good hunter goes out, she gives so much away and takes home only a small piece for herself, but she will always walk away feeling bukarpa. Bukarpa is what women see as the reward for Merlia. So bukarpa means generally warmth and happiness, but it's a happiness that's the product of generosity that binds people together. Without generosity, you feel you're not in a family. You're just for yourself, not for everybody. You don't share things. According to Mardu, good hunters share in order to demonstrate their commitment to building family and contributing to the public good. And this is the kind of sharing that we would experience around the dinner table. It's the sharing that cements social relationships, that feeds and nourishes, but treats everyone like family. Theoretically, we know that the generation of warmth and trust through demonstrating generosity tends to have substantial effects on the likelihood of cooperation. And there's been quite a bit of experimental work suggesting that people tend to cooperate with and trust more those who demonstrate generosity. And this suggests that one reason women share so widely may have something to do with their cooperative social networks. Marta women are more than twice as likely as men to hunt cooperatively, and for some hunting activities, more than 40 times likely to be cooperative. Women also cooperate in childcare, cooking, and other daily activities in ways that cross cut their residential group memberships. Older and younger women, even those from different hearth groups, will team up to cooperate in childcare and different forms of foraging and subsistence activities, dividing their labor so that some will hunt while others collect. One of the most frequent forms of cooperation today is in small animal hunting. And so this is a small animal cooperative hunting network. Hunting partners help each other out in tracking, digging, and searching for prey. They usually pool their catch. Again, the same sort of colors are indicating the kin groups. And it turns out that women who are more generous on average, but not those who are necessarily the best hunters, are more central in this cooperation network, meaning they have more partners, and they have more partners who are also more generous. So this supports the hypothesis that one of the main reasons that women share is to foster more cooperative relationships with other women. So this story of women's hunting in desert Australia gives us a much different picture of the goals of hunting and its associations with gender than we've generally gotten from other hunter-gatherers. It breaks a lot of our assumptions about who hunts and why. Foraging women can be efficient hunters and trackers, and small animal hunting can be just as productive and more reliable than large animal hunting. Women can even specialize on small animals if it's reliable enough. Women can support a number of others from their hunting efforts, not just children, and can engage with others as cooperative political and social agents outside of the spousal union. Women can share meat outside of their immediate families and draw on those ties created through meat sharing to engage in other cooperative endeavors. Women can form divisions of labor with other women and in so doing collaboratively, bleh, collaboratively both care and provision dependence with meat independently of men. So a model of the origins of human hunting and sociality based on women's acquisition and sharing of small animals, I think, is at least as plausible, if not more so, than models based on men's hunting of big game and women's dependence on men's hunting production. Thank you.